Professor Sabatka, when you were beginning the work that led to this paper on the diverse faces of the second demographic transition in Europe, uh, published in Demographic Research in 2008, what kind of issues led you to work on this question? What, were, what was the research issue that you were trying to resolve? Uh, so actually, it's quite a long history, so let me start with the germination of my interest in the second demographic transition. Back in the early 1990s, uh, mid-1990s, when I started studying at Charles University in Prague, and I was interested in huge fertility changes which were taking place at that time all over Eastern Europe. Some of my teachers and some of the people at the time were claiming that this is all because of economic uncertainty. That women are not having babies and postponing marriages. Um, men are also postponing marriages, of course, because they face this massive economic uncertainty, new economic situation, unemployment. And at the same time, uh, there were discussions in, liter in international population literature surrounding this concept of the second demographic transition, which was first published in 1987 by Dirk van der Kaa and Trumles Hagen. And this was a completely different world for me. Uh, they centered on ideational changes, new ways how women and men are thinking about their relationships, about having children, about how do they organize their lives, uh, about the values of marriage, and uh, different preferences for living arrangements. And I was feeling that this is actually much more what's going on uh, in my country, in the Czech Republic, but also in much of the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the economic uncertainty was part of the picture, but clearly something changed in people's minds. And perhaps also partly, this was also partly because of huge education expansion at that time, Many younger people were studying at universities. So that was the start of my interest. And then, of course, I was developing in my professional career. I was not only discussing this with my Czech colleagues, but I met Ron Leshage at different meetings and conferences. I was meeting Dirk, Dirk van der Kaa, and we were discussing the concepts. And in the early 2000s, there were two or three conferences organized around the framework of the second demographic transition. Mm -hmm. One is in Spa in Belgium, one was in Germany, in Karlsruhe, and you got 100 people, wonderful, brilliant scholars mixed with young students, discussing different concepts of family changes and discussing partly the second demographic transition. So you could imagine that this was the period when many things uh, were kind of happening in my mind, um, mm -hmm. a lot of thinking was going on and it was great to be confronted with all these discussions. Is it a real trend? Is it happening just in European countries? Will it spread to Eastern Europe? Will it spread to East Asia? Uh, does it neglect some of the factors uh, or is it too broad and does it try to put everything into one pot? And then. Around 2006, I was collaborating with Thomas Freika, Laurent Toulemon and Jan Hoem on a massive collaborative project which was trying to map family and fertility change in different countries in Europe. And at the same time, we wanted to have some summaries of different changes, different trends. What is going on with families? What is going on with fertility trends? Uh, so that we don't have just individual chapters covering individual countries. So each of us, we divided different topics between us and I was very happy to kind of take, take a view on the second demographic transition mm -hmm. and write this chapter. So I, I did it all by myself, but on my, in my mind I was informed by this more than a decade of discussions, uh, both in person with colleagues and reading papers about the second demographic transition and debates which were going on attending meetings and conferences. And then I try to sit and try to put together these different pieces of the puzzle and, and try to make some sense of, of the concept and um, mm -hmm. of its application and its validity uh, in the European context at that time. And when you were looking for 
the data was this agreed upon among you as the as the group of researchers we're going to all cover this same group of countries and our focus was on Europe so yeah. that was quite well defined we knew we have to take uh, we have to cover quite well Eastern European countries which was also kind of novel contribution mm -hmm. uh, of these books because they were often neglected in international demographic right. literature and that was the interesting challenge to take the framework of the second demographic transition and discuss its applicability, its validity and usefulness in the context of rapidly changing families and fertility trends in Central and Eastern Europe at that time. Now when you started doing the actual analysis of the data from these different countries and putting together the f findings or the results that you would write the chapter around, did you see some things, did you start to find some results that changed the way you were thinking about the whole concept in the process of doing the, the actual data analysis? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that something would completely change my mind because kind of data I was putting together, I, I knew about the broad trends in family behaviors. Mm -hmm. I knew a lot about the broad shifts in attitudes. But there were things which were, and they remain paradoxical without the second demographic transition framework, and sometimes they remain different, difficult to explain how do they fit within the framework. And Eastern, Central Eastern Europe is the region where you can pick many of these paradoxes and you can look at many of these paradoxes. One of them is clear uh, also for many countries in Western Europe. It is it seems to be the, the upper educated people who are expressing first the normative change, the change in views about marriage, uh, about childlessness. When you ask them value questions. When you ask them value questions, but they are often the last ones to pick up the behavioral change. So paradoxically, the behavioral change, not in all the aspects, like for instance, fertility postponement is clearly starting with the higher educated groups everywhere, but the shift away from marriage towards cohabitation. That's something which in most countries starts first with lower educated people mm -hmm. uh, who seem to express more traditional values and uh, they are less tolerant of all kinds of new demographic behaviors and family trends when you ask them in surveys. So that was clearly one paradox in Central Eastern European context the other one was that in many countries all these shifts towards more cohabitation, less marriages, uh, more non-traditional living arrangements was really taking place during the times of economic crisis. Why, did it, why didn't it start earlier? Uh, why does it correlate with economic crisis, especially when you go farther east, looking at Russia, Ukraine, mm -hmm. Romania? So that was a very interesting and challenging environment uh, to try to see how much the SDT, Second Demographic Transition Framework, can be applicable beyond Western European context and uh, how to explain some of these paradoxes. Mm -hmm. You introduce another uh, term in your paper besides Second Demographic Transition. You were talking about the pattern of disadvantage. Uh, how do you see the link between the pattern of disadvantage and the second demographic transition? Are they opposites? Uh, how do, do they fit together at all? <laughs> um. I, I, th I think they are complementary. So they, they both take a very different uh, approach towards explaining, for instance, why lower educated women uh, are much more often shifting, drifting away from marriage towards all kinds of non-conventional living mm -hmm. arrangements. But at the same time, uh, I think we need to look at both of these concepts to understand what's going on. Um, think, again, let me, let, let me take an example of the Czech Republic. Um, if you look at the situation in 1990, just after the communist regime collapsed all over Eastern Europe, the rate of non-marital childbearing, 4%, 4 or 5% of births were outside of marriage. Now, if you look at it, at the country today, it's 48 percent. Mm -hmm. um, this is the second demographic transition. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the educational gradient, 
in non-marital childbearing, it's about 70, maybe 80% of lower educated women have children outside marriage, and maybe 20% of university educated. I don't know, I, yeah, I don't know the number precisely. Like so uh, I think without changes in people's minds, without people realizing and thinking that they can organize their relationships in the way they want, that's the second demographic transition. Mm -hmm. Such a shift cannot happen. Uh, something happened in the attitudes towards the institution of marriage. Something happened in the way how people perceive whether they have to marry if a woman gets pregnant, for instance, which was a very common pathway back in the 70s and 1980s. But at the same time, the pattern of disadvantage clearly kicks in because people, many people continue valuing marriage and it's the better educated with more resources and uh, of course with partners which are uh, kind of more desirable in, in a way who can still realize this kind of idea yes we want to marry eventually maybe they marry after having a child but most of them marry at the end of the day and it's the lower educated people who struggle this lack of resources unstable partnerships uh, inability to find a partner they would like to who will never make it towards marriage despite most of them valuing marriage still. Mm -hmm. Now you've mentioned the attitudes and the behaviors and how they're not always consistent. In the article you, you uh, adopt the, the phrase ready, willing and able. Yes. Uh, can you explain a little bit how you see that terminology, that concept uh, and how it relates to this question of the attitudes versus the, the behavior of the people? So it's, it's actually Ernles Hage who picks up the concept for uh, explaining some of the changes uh, in demographic behaviors uh, and also looking at the second demographic transition. I, I'm, I'm thinking where did he, when did he first wrote about this? I think it was late 1990s. Yeah, I think he got the idea from Ansley Cole. Yes, and he exactly, he got the idea from Ansley Cole describing the first demographic transition, right. fertility decline during the first demographic transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I try to simplify the idea, uh, the gist of it is that you need to take the new behavior within the framework of conscious, rational choice. It should be something which which is acceptable for you to do. That's, that's the readiness part. Mm -hmm. So people should accept in their minds, I don't need to marry. I can have children outside marriage. I can have children when I'm 35. I don't need to have them when I'm 22. So that's, that's the readiness part. But they should be willing in the sense that the new behavior should also be within the calculus of their economic rational choice. It shouldn't be making them more disadvantaged than they were before. So in this sense, for instance, one can see the fact that second demographic transition hasn't been progressing in Central and Eastern Europe until the late 1980s through the prism of the fact that the government supported the institution of marriage, for instance, through preferential loans, loans for the newlyweds through distribution of housing. Right. So non-marrying wouldn't be a rational decision for most of the people. Because you won't get an apartment. You wouldn't get, you wouldn't get an apartment. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't get your loan. Yeah. Uh, why, why wouldn't you marry? Yeah. And yeah. Um, the ability part, the last component, uh, essentially tells you you should have the means to, uh, to behave in the new way. If you don't have access to contraception, it's difficult to postpone children until the age of 35 in this SDT framework. And th then again, you can... Unless you're very unpopular. Unless <laughs> popular, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, and, then, and then again, when you look at uh, this interesting concept of Central and Eastern Europe, many young people, they didn't know much about contraception. There was no sex education at schools. Mm -hmm. There was very limited access to contraceptive pill and a lot of prejudices around it. Yep. Abortion was widely used for stopping behavior after women had one or two kids, but not for kind of spacing or postponing behavior. So again, in this concept, when you take this 
framework of Reddit will enable you can you can to a large ex extent explain and deal with some of the paradoxes and uh, peculiarities in this framework of the second demographic transition. Mm -hmm. What were the reactions to your paper? What did, what did you hear after you published this paper? Negative, um, positive? Yeah. Actually, the interesting thing, but I think it happens with most of the papers, uh, most of the papers you publish things, people don't come to you and they don't tell you, oh, it's horrible or you wrote the most amazing paper I've ever seen. So, there, I mean, reviewers were overall quite positive. So they had relatively minor points. I think I had three reviewers and they were very decent and they were suggesting minor changes and picking up some small components which they disagreed with. And um, there were no immediate reactions of colleagues telling me that's nonsense. Ronald Hages surprisingly didn't object to the paper. He, he seems to be quite happy with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it started picking up uh, when you look at the references and people using it, citing it. It was one of these slower papers. Uh, so mm -hmm. no big reactions at the start, but over time you see that people are reading it and referring to it and mm -hmm. kind of yes. making some use of it. Sometimes students have to read it. Yeah, yes, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor students are asking the class to, to read a 40-page uh, paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you still stand by most of your conclusions? How has your thinking changed since you wrote the paper at all? Uh, there would be elements which probably shifted a little bit. Now, uh, with the framework of the second demographic transition, it's difficult to completely change your way of thinking as long as you accept that it's a very broad framework. So you cannot, if you, if you are a person who accepts that uh, there is a way how you can try to reconcile different pieces of evidence and make a somewhat coherent narrative which tries to put together these different trends into a unified framework and you know right from the start it will not fit each and every country and it will not explain yeah. every aspect of human behavior. So it's a big kind of thing which makes sense for explaining big drift in family behavior. But it doesn't probably make much sense when you study individual country and try to explain something happening in five years period right. in that one country. So as, as long as you are in this mindset that you are okay with these broad frameworks, um, it's difficult to suddenly change your view and come to the conclusion that uh, this is something which doesn't work out or it's mm -hmm. unimportant. But having said that, when I think about it from today's perspective, I think the framework missed quite a lot on all the current debates on gender relations, uh, gender revolution. It, if you, especially when you read the original papers by Ron Lezaghi and Van de Ka, they mention very little about gender relations, That's true. Uh, gender inequalities, and the ways how they shape the family behaviors. So that's an aspect which is certainly missing. And Ron kind of, over time, he keeps adding stuff to, to the original mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you see that he's trying to accommodate uh, different pieces of new evidence. People used to, to build houses in the same way. They would add yes. on extra rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it kind of makes sense because you, it, it still keeps the framework mm -hmm. coherent and uh, quite consistent. But that, that was clearly an element missing there, and I don't discuss it much in, in the 2008 paper. Okay. Well, thank you for writing the paper in 2008, and, <laughs> and thank you. you for taking the time to talk to thank us about you. it today. Thanks.